to start recording now, and I'm going to hand the session over to Dr. Tony O'Driscoll from Duke University. He's got a fabulous amount of theoretical understanding of this, but also practical experience, both in the workplace and also in higher ed, about how do you do things online. If anybody was prepared for this, it was Tony, but even he had a few surprises on the route. I'm going to hand it over to you, Tony, to tell your story about scrapping the syllabus and getting online fast. Over to you. Thanks, Don. Let me just first do a check to make sure my audio is okay. You sound great. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, great to see so many people here. Uh, I believe that Hannah said in terms of registrations, we had we had Argentina all the way to uh, Zambia, if I'm not mistaken, even two people from Mauritius, where I spent most of my youth. So uh, very international audience. Thank you all for getting up in the middle of the night for some of you, uh, getting up early in the morning for others. I really appreciate it. The first question I have uh, is one that I start every session with since COVID has arrived. And it goes as follows. One word, please type into chat how you are feeling. One word, how are you feeling? I like that, just one word. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sort of scrolling past word cloud, isn't it, that gives you a real sense of what's That's going right. on. That's right. Um, nice question. Yeah. So, so thank you all for, for sharing that. Um, I think one of the most important things in this, when, we, when we're in a modality that's a little tighter and we don't necessarily have video because we're worried about bandwidth issues, um, and we can get very concerned about jumping into our presentation and moving on, just as we would in the physical world where we have a, a syllabus and a curriculum and a lesson plan that we have to get through. Uh, but when we're in the physical world, we can capture cues in the room. Uh, and so, so I think it's, it's always good, I call it top and tail. It's always good at the top to get a pulse for how we're feeling as a group. And, and I, I find the one word is helpful because it, 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 it forces folks to um, perhaps be a bit more vulnerable than they want and, and put that word in there and give you a sense. So it, it looks like we're, we're all over the map uh, and that's exactly where we should be. We all, um, process uh, uncertainty differently. And we also then have particular situations like my kids are right on the, on the back door here banging. And uh, so therefore that's inducing a bit of stress. So thank you all for doing that. Um, today I'm going to, to try to share with you a four, a four part narrative. Uh, I'm gonna spend the first 10 minutes talking a little bit about the learning orthodoxies that we all hold. Then I'm gonna go into a, a, a detailed story of um, what I'm call, affectionately calling or what my students call the COVID-19 pivot for a, for a course that I teach at Duke. Then I'm going to um, discuss a little bit about how those two things come together in some, some potential uh, areas where learning might change. And finally, then I've tried to synthesize with Don's help um, some new design rules that I've found as a result of this whirlwind, whirlwind transfer over the last month. Uh, so first, overcoming learning orthodoxies. I'm originally from Ireland. I know I don't sound it. My wife actually married me from my Irish accent and she's thinking about trading me in. If you live in America long enough, you tend to pick up the American accent, particularly if you live in the South. So, but I am originally from Ireland and uh, so humor is a fun thing and we always, we always have to start a presentation with a, a quick funny story. So if you'll indulge me here for a couple of minutes, I'll tell you a story. This is my son Aiden when he was six years old uh, he, and he was in middle school in, in, in America, just before you go into, or just about to go into middle school. And um, he had a summer project. And that summer project, we live in North Carolina. His summer project was to find out how the lost colony became lost. That was defined by him. So being an educator, I said, great, we'll do a field trip, get your field notes. And we drove on a very hot day in, in July to North Carolina, uh, or to Manteo, North Carolina on, on the coast. And we went into a uh, set, the settlement because they've, they've kind of recreated the, the lost colony there. My son had his hat on and his notebook, and we start trundling around that 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 particular settlement. And we go into the first building, and it's, daddy, daddy, the questions start coming. For those of you who have young kids, uh, I, I sympathize with you right now if they're locked up in your house because they're full of questions and they're full of curiosity. We go into this one building, and said, daddy, daddy, what's this? And I said, well. It's a blacksmith. And well, daddy, daddy, what's a blacksmith? And I said, well, they made horseshoes. Well, daddy, daddy, why do they make horseshoes? So kids naturally do the five whys. 
I said, well, because back then they got around with horses and they had to make shoes to put on the horses. He says, oh, daddy, if they didn't have minivans, if they didn't have cars, maybe they died because they got lost because they couldn't get around fast enough and they couldn't run away. I said, okay, jot that down in your notebook and now you know the story. We go into the next building. This is the clothier. Say, daddy, daddy, what are we doing here? Well, this is where they made clothes. Well, how did they make clothes, daddy? Well, they sheared the sheep. They sheared the sheep. What were they doing with sheep? Did that hurt them, daddy? And so on. This is the loom and this is the mill and this is the sewing machine. Well, daddy, maybe they froze to death because they were so cold. They couldn't just go to the shop and, and, and buy clothes. I said, okay, write that down in your notebook. At this point in time, as a parent, I'm sure you're all getting getting the, the, the picture here. This is, could have gone on forever. So I was hoping that by we, the time we got to the third one, we could stop. I, again, it was very, very hot, and I wanted to go get a, a Coca-Cola and sit in the air conditioning. We go into the next uh, building. Daddy, daddy, what's this? It's a bakery. Well, what? How do, how do they do this? This is the wheat. This is the chaff. This is the grist. This is the mill. This is the bellows. This is this is the bread. Oh, daddy. I know, I know now why it's a lost colony. They must have all starved to death. Nobody can survive without sliced bread. And so that, that was his answer. After going to these three places, I said, perfect, son. Write that down in your field book, and let's walk over to the cafeteria and get ourselves a, a drink because um, it's very hot, and, and we've done our assignment now. And as we're walking along, there's one big building, and, I, and, and my son stops in front of us and says, Daddy, Daddy, can we just have one more stop? Just one, please. And then he starts to go, please. He kept doing that. So I said, okay, fine. So we walk into this building and I sit there waiting for the barrage of questions, trying to anticipate what the answers will be. And Aiden says nothing. And he says, daddy, it's okay. We can go now. And I said, are you sure? And he said, yes, this is a school. Now, why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story because I think it's humorous, and I think that there's wisdom in humor. And I think that the, the, the funny part of this story is that if Plato came into my classroom at Duke University, except for wondering why the board was white instead of black, he'd understand what was going on. Uh, and that's because our system has not, has not changed in forever. That, that our mental model, our limiting orthodoxies, where we kind of bound teaching and learning together in this construct of the classroom, of the program, the teacher, the course, the topic, the curriculum, the student, the test, uh, has been around for so long that we don't question it, that we don't, that we don't kind of try to push the boundaries on this particular cognitive frame that we have. Uh, and there's a real danger there. There's a real danger there if we're not careful. Uh, Peter Senge, who is a uh, you know who wrote the learning organization back in the 90s, says it himself. In organization learning efforts, the confusion between training and learning is fatal. That training is certainly a subset of learning, and the modality of the classroom is certainly an important one. I'm a university professor for crying out loud. And at the same time, uh, learning is not just the domain of training. And, and and in this world where we're moving digital, I think there's an even more uh, important issue that we need to con be concerned about, and that is the routinization trunk. It, it, I, I, one of my areas is innovation, and if you look at the sweep of history of innovation and some of some of the wonderful innovations that have kind of changed the course of our lives, can you hear me, Dan? Everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine. Okay. Uh, I think what happened was somebody dialed in and they muted their line for Darwin. So please okay, carry on. Uh, so Gutenberg came up with the printing press in 1450, uh, printed the German Bible uh, starting in the, in, in the, in the 1500s, and, and, and then we didn't see other books happen till 1520. And arguably, that's, that's the, that innovation didn't really see its full value for se until 70 years later, because printing other books too ushered in uh, a whole new enlightenment, movie, enlightenment period. You know, Watt came up with the steam engine that first went into a steam boat, but it's when it became the locomotive that that started to really change the economy in Britain. Uh, and Lumiere, there's a, some argument as to who came up with the first moving picture camera, but let's give it to the Lumiere brothers right now. It was invented, and then uh, for, for uh, over a year, all people did was film plays until somebody came up with the notion of a cut, that you could film something, stop in time, and then film another piece and put them together, and then you have this little thing called Hollywood and Bollywood. Um, and so the idea here uh, from Peter Drucker, I think is very important, is the routinization trap happens when we apply radically new technologies to automate the past, bad assumptions and all. And so I think as we're stepping into 
this new technological domain, not by choice, but by circumstance. Uh, we, it's, it, when we're under pressure as human beings, uh, it, biologically, the blood is drawn from our head and from our ex down into our legs, which means our executive function gets shut down. We tend to go reptilian. We tend to go back to what we know. And so our tendency would be to use the technology to accelerate the way we teach. And, 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 and in doing so, I would suggest that we're perhaps limiting a lot of the affordances that technology has to allow students to learn. It's a very difficult thing to do when you're under time pressure, uh, but allowing us to ask the question of how might the technology help others learn rather than how do I use the technology to do exactly what I've done before, i.e. turn lecture pages. That would be a very good first step from my perspective. And so my first question here is, you know, overcoming our learning orthodoxies is how might we think outside the classroom frame to amplify and augment what I call generative networked learning experience, GNLE, generative networked learning experiences, which is what I believe we're going to need a lot more uh, in a post-COVID world. So that's, that's my little preamble, little humorous story. Fundamental point there is avoiding the routinization trap, which is trying to take you know, brand spanking new, whiz-bang technology to automate the past, bad assumptions at all. Uh, um, Don Fuller from, from HP, who is the CLO of HP, uh, I always remember a warning he gave me many years ago, is um, technology is, is a mechanism to increase the efficiency with which we train poorly. Uh, and his point on that was that we, if we just do what we've always done on technology, we're not giving the learners the opportunity that they that they deserve. So that's that's the lesson on that. Uh, so now what I'd like to do is 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 put put some of that theory into practice in a very real and visceral way at, at Duke. And so I teach in a program called the Global Executive MBA program at Duke University. We've got a class size of 94. It is our most senior executive program. So we have folks with you know up to 28 years worth of experience. And the reason they join this program is because they, they number one, uh, want to gain more international experience. Uh, number two, they want to build a, a, a network of colleagues that are at the same level in organizations, and but maybe from a, a wide variety of industries. We have 85 organizations represented. We have 19 uh, international representation in terms of where people are living and 22% in terms of citizenship. We have a huge range of industries represented. Uh, and folks from 24 countries. So this is a very global program with a very global representation. Um, and, and, and it's also global in terms of how we run it. So we start the program. It's a, it's a, it's a residential distance program. In each country, we have uh, 10 days on the ground in residence. So we, we were in Durham uh, in July. Then we went to Shanghai in October. Then we, went, we were supposed to go to Santiago, Chile, in term three in January, but because of the unrest in Santiago, Chile, we had to move the whole program to Lima, Peru, which that in itself was a little bit of a disruption. Um, and then we were getting ready for the India residency in Delhi on April 24th. And that's where my story begins. So a global program, uh, very, very uh, seasoned executives who are in this program to travel the world and experience different uh, ways of working, different cultures, different different um, international perspectives and business models. That's the program. Uh, so scrapping the syllabus. So let me give you a little rundown of what happened. On February 20th, we got a note from the Duke, uh, the Dean of Executive Education saying, we're hearing about this, this strange uh, virus but our plan at the moment is to go ahead with the Delhi residency. So I said, fine, I'll take my lectures from last time. I'll dust them off. We should be good to go. On March 2nd, the business school of Hukka made a decision to move the residency to Durham. So in the space of 12 days, uh, things had gotten visibly worse. The students were clearly in an uproar at this point in time because we weren't quite aware. And, and, they, and, and, and they, you know, they said, this is an international program. I don't want to go back to Durham. We've already been to Durham. Uh, Ten days later, Duke University uh, administration decides to move all courses online. Every single course is being moved online. Uh, and so we had from March 12th to March 22nd, where we extended spring break, 
to essentially take every course at Duke, which was 6,000 courses, and flip them over from physical to virtual. So, so that was, um, you know, I was planning on having a very nice, fun spring break with my family, and that's certainly not what happened. And so Duke University itself stood up 6,000 courses, and there's some data there online by the numbers. Um, moving to a Zoom platform, we, we opted to use Zoom, uh, and we use Canvas on the back end. Well, it depends on which, which, which particular college. Some colleges use Sakai, some colleges use Canvas, some colleges use other platforms to kind of do the learning management system administration. But this was uh, the largest digital transformation that the, the university had ever gone, undergone. And I think, as as my dean said, um, you know, none of us asked for this, and we have to come through this together. And I think, by and large, we did come through together. I worried about everything from technological back end, whether it would work. Wor wor worried about bandwidth in our own basements as to whether or not too many kids were playing playing Fortnite online and kind of draining the bandwidth. But we we managed to learn and move through all of those technical hurdles. Now, uh, when it comes to me, uh, those 94 students began to clamor that said, I teach a class called Global Markets and Institutions, where all we talk about is um, how institutions work around the world, how markets work around the world, how technology is impacting that. And they basically said to me, there is no way that we cannot talk about COVID-19. It's on our, it's, it's first and foremost on our minds. And if you don't change the syllabus, you're going to have a revolt on your hands. They didn't say it in that many words, but that's how I knew what was going on. So, so two days later, I said, fine. Uh, if you want to do a redesign of the course, I can't do it myself. You need to appoint a design team that represents the 94. And, and within five minutes, I had a design team, student design team of eight students who were elected by the, by the student body to work with me to redesign the program. And we proceeded to have uh, daily meetings from March 27th till April 24th. We had 28 days to redesign the course. Um, from March 27th to April 18th, the first thing we did was come up with a set of principles because we knew that we, we needed the guidelines and principles. We didn't know exactly where we were going to, to, to figure out what this learning experience would be like, what the outcomes would be, what the phases would be, what the content should be. Communication was key, networking was key, and iterating was key. When we got to April 19th, we recognized that in order to understand something as complex as COVID, a simulation uh, would be a would be a good stretch goal, and so with 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 six days to go, we decided let's give this a go, and we we started to build with friends from Sapien Experience a simulation that was built around leading through COVID-19, and then after very very little sleep during that last week, we launched the program on April 24th. Um, so the first thing is design principles. We we developed these six design principles on our very first design day. We shared that with the student body. Uh, the student body blessed those principles and gave us the power to move forward and to adhere to those principles. And, and that's what we did. So, so we were talking about it has to be something we're going to do, not something we're going to talk about. Uh, we have to leverage our global footprint because we had people all around the world who were seeing what was happening with COVID. We had to uh, leverage the experience because we had people who were in healthcare all the way through consultancies, all the way through government ministries. So we had we had a, a network of people who really could get a sense of what was going on with COVID. We had access to a number <clears throat> of subject matter experts, even within Duke, because we have a great medical school to understand what was going on. Um, and we agreed that we would work in design teams and we needed to apply design thinking to try to solve for some of these what we call second order effects. Um, and so those were the principles that we adhere to in going through the design. Uh, what we came up with as a group was three phases. The first phase was facing our current emotional reality, which goes back to what I spoke about earlier, uh, which was how are we feeling? And everybody was processing things at a different level. And, and so we needed to acknowledge our current emotional reality. We had a kickoff meeting with two, two friends and colleagues of mine, both of whom who have experience in uh, crisis management. And we talked about how it is we have to deal with our emotional reality. Uh, and, and what we did there was we, we created, we agreed to create three discussion boards online. One was about how are we feeling and how do we lead with emotional intelligence for ourselves and for our people, because remember, these are leaders. Second is addressing daily, daily dilemmas. Each one of these folks were managers in their own right, and they had daily dilemmas. And now we had built a community where they could openly and transparently and trustingly share the dilemmas they were facing and get guidance and counsel and support from their peers who they knew pretty well because we were you know, two thirds of the way through the program. And third then was getting a grip. And those were kind of 
uh, processes, practices, routines, information uh, that could be useful. Any any kind of uh, um, a picture of what the growth mindset looks like, a, a parable from a particular faith, just things that people found useful as information sources to get by. So we put those three discussion boards up, no grades, no nothing, and they were on fire that the people really use these uh, during phase one at a distance to kind of talk about how they felt, to talk about and get guidance on their daily dilemmas, and to share useful resources to deal with the, the emotional reality. We believe that that phase was absolutely critical because had we not had that phase, we would not have been able to move into the second phase, which was to get on with the hard work of figuring out how are we going to deal with COVID and its second order effect challenges. And that was the second piece where we had to actually do the content creation, organize this content in a meaningful way. And for something that's very emergent like COVID, uh, that was a challenge in and of itself. Um, and the third phase then is what they're about to start tomorrow, uh, is they're going to go in as 16 different design thinking teams, and they're going to work through this process using a design thinking approach, a sprint-based design thinking approach over the next four weeks. So that's the phases that we designed. We then went off to develop the content, which involved reading a whole lot of reports, uh, gathering a whole bunch of expert perspectives that were available online, and then talking to 20 subject matter experts. And, and what we then developed was a, a, a briefing paper for the students called Towards Pandemic Resilience. It was a five-page paper that tried to condense everything we knew so far. And more importantly, it, 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 it built a, um, 16, a set of 16 second-order effects that as management professionals, we thought we should be worried about, and I'll, I'll explain those in, 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 a, in due course. Okay, so that was phase one. Phase two, uh, we run our courses in sessions. And so in phase two, we had three sessions, Friday, April 24th for two and a half hours, Saturday, April 25th for two and a half hours, and that should say Sunday, I apologize, Sunday, April 26th for two and a half hours. Uh, and and it, we always, in my class, always start with a question. What is the question we're going to explore together? Always lead with the question. So the first question was, how might we optimally respond to COVID-19 to minimize societal loss, maximize economic rate of economic recovery, and maintain social cohesion? When we spoke to uh, experts all around the world, those were the three variables that mattered the most. Uh, minimizing deaths, maximizing uh, the rate of re economic recovery while not minimizing debts, and making sure that you do so in a way that maintains social cohesion. Those seem to be the three most important variables, whether you're the leader of a company, leader of a household, leader of a government, leader of an NGO, similar set of issues. And so we recognize that in order to do that in a very short amount of time and to get all of the students to the same place in terms of understanding something as complex as COVID, what we would need to do is develop a simulation. And so we, we in, over the space of six days, we built the simulation. The point here is not about the simulation, it's about using technology in a different way to get a group of people to a shared understanding of the nuances associated with something complex. Um, so it's not about the technology as much as it is about the modality. This could have been done on paper. We were fortunate enough to be able to work with a simulation team that are good friends that were willing to work with us, so it looked a little prettier. But the content was the same, whether the content looks pretty in a simulation or whether the content could have been a paper quiz is, is, is the key point. So the way that the, the, that the process works is we had a first round where the students were ex introduced to COVID-19 and what the issues were, and then they had to make six decisions, three about health, where you allocate money for health, and three about the economy, where you allocate money for the economy. And then based on those choices, round two was all about where you spent money for pandemic resilience in terms of treatment, in terms of vaccines, and in terms of mental health. And then round four, I'm sorry, round three was about how are we going to do contact tracing? Should we do it uh, in, in a very centralized and coordinated and kind of authoritarian way or not? And that varied by country and by culture. But essentially the, the design of the simulation focused on the first eight second order effects. Who gets the money, who gets the equipment, who gets uh, what, what, what to invest in for testing, uh, who gets the treatment, who gets mental health, what about the food and, and, the, and, and what happens when this goes into the Southern hemisphere, how will industry be reshaped and how, how should we be traced? Those were the eight kind of key variables that we used inside the simulation. Just to give you a quick taste of what it looked like when the students came in, this is the first page. They saw the COVID simulation. 
They were introduced to the fact that they were going to be part of a citizen's assembly, which means that they had to vote what they felt was the right answer. They then were explained a little bit of how the dynamics of this particular disease works and, and, and what really matters in terms of the levers for making the right kinds of decisions. They were then given their day zero decision where they had to allocate the investment. They then had to literally allocate the investment by moving these sliders and they had a budget of uh, 1.9 trillion that they had to allocate across these six different variables. We then were able to process the results. So on the top here, these graphs up here show what the students allocated. So you can see wide variability and some of them allocated a whole lot to international aid, some of them allocated zero to international aid. Some of them allocated a whole lot to small business, others allocated very little. So we're able to have a discussion about what was their thinking in when they did that. And then down below, uh, each student got their own feedback on whether or not they went above the line. So did you invest enough for your health care uh, to be where it needed to be, or did you not? Meaning that anyone above the line here essentially would, would represent a system overload from a health care perspective. And then if you hit, hit system overload, your, your economic resilience would go down because your workforce gets hit. You have to go back into quarantine, et cetera, et cetera. And so that made for a very rich discussion where the students to, understood what was going on quite well. Uh, the outcomes of this were, you know, based on your decisions, each individual student, they would have a positive outcome for health or a negative outcome for health, meaning we're back to, nor to a new normal. Uh, we've managed to contain the spread of the disease or no, we're still in quarantine like a year later. Uh, talking about the economy, we're back to getting our hair cut or we're, we're, or we're, or we're in bad shape and unemployment goes through the roof. Talking about societies, we've managed to do so by maintaining our, our core values as a society, or we had to give up some of what we what we value as a society in order to do this. Um, so the second, Tony, can I quickly? Yeah, in? we've got a, a question from Steve asking: Is the tool online? I think I think there's two parts to that question. The first question is: Was it online for all the students to access? And I'm assuming the answer mm -hmm. is yes. But the other side of it, I'm guessing, is this is a tool that is online only for your students. It's not widely available. We're, we're hoping to make it more widely available. Um, we did the first run of it uh, three days ago, four days ago, uh, and we have a few bugs to shake out. But the plan would be that we would we would want to make that available to educators, yes, if, if, if they want to use it. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Okay. And also, can I just say, you're right in the middle of doing this, and you're coming here to talk to us for an hour and spend a lot of time getting this deck ready. Thank you so much for that as well, Tony. Thank oh, you're very welcome. My pleasure. It's my pleasure. We're all in this together. Um, the second day then, now that we kind of used a modality like a simulation for everybody to come to, a, a, not necessarily a shared understanding, but a, a real understanding of what the variables are and what the second order effects are, we, um, we, we I convened a panel, uh, and I must say that I'm so fortunate, number one, to work at a place like Duke, but to, to have colleagues who are willing to come and join in a conversation with students. And that's exactly what it was. My rule uh, to, to the participants, to the discussants was, you get five minutes up top to tell us how far you can see into the future in your particular area and what you think the key scenario will be. And after that, it is all about discussion. And so this is kind of what it looked like. Um, so I had, I had six folks who were, who were discussing, uh, but, but I think you'll see here, this is kind of a chronological view the students became quite involved, and this became very much of a, a, a light touch facilitated discussion where at the end of it, the discussants even said that was the coolest thing I've done all week because we were really curating a meaningful conversation around the further out second order effects. And even some of my discussants were asking questions of the others. Students were coming in with their perspective, uh, and I would probably say that that's the best two and a half hours I've spent since the arrival of COVID-19 with very little structure except the five minute rule to kick the conversation off. Um, and then the most important thing here is using the back channel, using the back channel very specifically. So as we're having this very rich dialogue, one of the things that I teach is that we have to process something complex at, at, at a level of insight, not at a level of data or information, but at a level of insight. Trying to tap into the insight of each individual in the room uh, in, in a very practical way. And I do that using a, tech, a, a process called whoa, aha, uh -huh, hmm. Whoa is if something catches your attention. I don't believe that. I think that's crap. Wow, I never knew that. Aha uh -huh is an insight you might get from that whoa. And hmm is the inevitable question that comes after that. So what I asked of the students was to be very deliberate in putting an asterisk in front of a whoa, an exclamation mark in front of an aha, uh -huh, and a question in front of a hmm. 
And the question wasn't a question of the people. It was a question of myself after having had an insight. And what happened then was the back channel uh, started to be coded by Wawaha Hm, which allowed one of my colleagues who was working in parallel to capture them all in a document and create a word cloud so we could get a real time feeling for where were we on the things that caught our attention most, the things that were the biggest ahas, and the things that are the hms, and then three documents that had each one of those items in there that the students could go and mine. And the aha one is, is a really powerful one, and the hmm one is a really powerful one, because you get these double loop learning questions that are really interesting to go and look, uh, look into deeper. So the back channel was not really just a mechanism to get questions back. The back channel was a was a double loop learning, a very deliberate generative learning tool that the students could then use to go follow uh, their curiosity coming out of the session. The last part of the session uh, involved, what are we going to do about this? One of the design principles was we need to do something. And so uh, very fortunate to have a good friend and colleague uh, from IDEO named Susan O'Malley. She put up her hand immediately and said, I will help these teams. We were going to create uh, design teams explain to them how design thinking works, which is a creative kind of problem solving process, um, stand up a platform that these students can use. Again, Mural, the company Mural, the CEO, gave us the platform and allowed, is allowing our students to use it for this design sprint. Um, the engagement here was superb. The students were really interested in the process. And then what we also found out through the back channel was that a number of our students in the class had already done some work in design thinking. And so they automatically formed a committee of support that they would help other students who didn't quite understand design thinking. And that's self-organizing. I'm not monitoring it. I'm not. I'm just trusting the process that they will take care of it because they're passionate about the activity. And then finally, we had a conversation about leadership because in, in business, you know, at the end of the day, particularly in times of crisis, we, we look to leadership. And Blair Shepard, who was the former dean of of the Fugal School and is now the head of leadership and strategy for PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC, I was kind enough to come in and spend an hour with our students talking about leadership uh, and about his book, which uh, is just about to come out called 10 Years to Midnight. The unfortunate thing is he thinks he has to revise the title uh, and he has to revise it down. He said it's probably now six years to midnight unless we can do something uh, better. So it was a it was a pretty firm conversation at the beginning uh, where Blair was quite quite clear as a leader in, in, in what he thought, but but uh, he also made one mention of, I think of you as my grandkids, um, because this was a program that he developed when he was there, and I was fortunate to, enough to work with him and the current dean, Bill Boulding, on that. Um, and at the end, the back channel was just really, really powerful in terms of, wow, the fact that we got to spend an hour with you just talking about what our future could look like and what leadership really means. Um, I think that the students really, really value that. Okay, so feedback, as I mentioned before, phase one and phase two, I always top and tail with how are you feeling? So when I started this, the session at the top, uh, people were feeling cooped up, okay, mellow, motivated, hungry, hopeful, bottled up. But the vibe was, you know, we've been through seven days of online learning from 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. We're a little burned out, to be honest. We did break it in the middle. We broke it for three days. That was another learning that we had, is that we can't do this much learning in, in a row. And at the end, it was Fuqua forever, hopeful, wonderful, optimistic, hopeful, optimistic, energized, grateful. And so so my my kind of, my, my immediate, immediate kind of feeling feedback said that we had managed to maybe move the curve a little bit on that. Um, and then the, the feedback started coming in that said, very positive feedback. We reinvigorated the group. Collective experience was positive. Uh, that was engaging. You took a moment to listen to the needs of the students. I'm proud to have worked with you on this. So the, a feeling of, of, of togetherness. Um, also some, some very candid, open and vulnerable feedback that the sessions were heavy. And I'm glad they're at the end of the day so I could think about them. I, I, I'm feeling extremely vulnerable during the discussions, but I thank you because I don't think I'd be able to grow in any other way without this opportunity. So, so very positive, um, I think, feedback from everybody involved for, for what we were able to create together. Um, and now they're off. So now they're off to pick one of the second order effects as a team. They will start tomorrow in a four week process of moving through this design thinking uh, experience that we have developed for them with the help of IDEO. 
They will do it on a collaborative platform because they're all living all around the world named Mural, which if you're not familiar with is a phenomenal platform for kind of doing collaborative creative work. Um, and uh, everybody was, was very excited about that, like I said, and, and when we have a small team that I met with yesterday that is kind of taking control of making sure that everybody's on the platform and knows how to use it. So that was the learning experience. Um, so what to take from that learning experience? Uh, I think there's a lot to take, and, and, and what Don asked me to do was perhaps take some of the research I've done on more of the academic side and kind of make it practical to, to what I think we're all experiencing. Um, uh, pop quiz. First thing is you always have to have a pop quiz at about 40 minutes into any session, otherwise people are asleep. So what does that represent? You should be seeing something on the screen right now. What is that thing? This is where I get to check if everybody's just doing their email or actually still focusing. Guys, what, what, what is this strange... It's a red uh, box. Red, it's a red, red line. It's the horizon. It's a, re it's a, okay, it's a, it's red, a red flag. Line. It's a red dot. It's what? a red square. It's a window. It's nice. Red. It's a box. Red peppermint. A like rectangle. That. It's a wobbly red line. Okay, you ready? What is it now? Aha. Uh -huh. What is it now? Maybe uh, people... In South Dakota? Maybe people in the United States. It's a state in the U.S. Good answer. Ohio, question mark. A state. It's a state. It's a state. Some place in the U.S. Ohio, a state. State in the U.S. Nebraska, question mark. Wyoming, question mark. Colorado, question mark. This is this is horrible um, because I'm from America. I mean, I live here, but I'm not exactly sure. I think it might be Wyoming. And somebody who is from that state will now probably correct me and say that's not Wyoming, but it is a state in uh, in, in in the United States, and it's it's out towards the west. I actually live here in North Carolina, and um, I clearly didn't take geography in America. But why am I showing you this? What's the point? Well, the point is content is king, meaning that red box might be king, but context, how you set that in a context is the kingdom. And I think that's one of the big learnings here is that um, creating the situational context is at least as important as the content. Uh, how are you feeling? Let's put you into a simulated environment so you can get to understand the nuance. Let's bring the right level of people in to have a meaningful conversation. I would say to you, that if I was going to try to convene those six experts in a regular channel at Duke University, I would have brought them in the night before, I would have taken them out to dinner, graciously thanked them and given them a 50 minute lecture. Here, I got to port six world experts in from all around the world. They each got five minutes and then we got into a two and a half hour conversation. I would not be able to do that in the physical world and I was able to do that in the virtual world and the impact was huge. It was a real sense-making session where everybody learned. And so I think the technological affordance is there to do something different, as long as we don't bring kind of some of those limiting assumptions into the virtual space with us. Uh, I do a lot of work with training, and so they asked me to kind of do this analysis of training 2020, writing the ways of change. It was at, it was at their conference here in the United States. I had about 400 um, chief learning officer folks uh, in the room. Uh, and ed higher education administrators, and I asked them, what will training look like five years from now? So we did a big design thinking type process. We had all these voting mechanisms. You know, we got the gestalt of the room. And, and here's the answer. The answer is, uh, this was done in 2020, uh, at the beginning of 2020. The answer is, uh, we'll see less institutional training, whether that's a company or, or, or kind of a, a, a NGO kind of thing, push to learner curiosity pull. That's, that learners have far more of, uh, availability at the moment to, to find a way to learn when they uncover something they don't know than they did be in the past. They can go to YouTube, they can go to Khan Academy, they can, they can feed their curiosity through a channel other than our own and they have autonomy in doing that. So, uh, you know, it, learning has become somewhat democratized. Um, have to go versus want to know. So instead of it being spoon fed, it's learner led. And it's learner led by the need to understand in the moment of need from user-centered to user-generated. So there's lots and lots of content that the users themselves are generating to help other people to learn. And so kind of the, the instructional designer is, is perhaps taken out of the middle. Uh, that doesn't mean it's necessarily good. It just means that it is happening. Uh, Institution-driven meaning prescriptive, learner-focused meaning personalized, classroom and schedule versus everywhere and on demand. So this is, this is kind of a view of trends, like where we think things are moving in the learning world. But they came into, if you, if you did the, I did the research, so uh, they, they came into four buckets. They came into a context bucket, which is why I led with that pop quiz. They came into a performance bucket. 
they came into a learning bucket and they came into a learner bucket. So I'd like to share with you some of the from twos from there. Um, uh, context center from twos is we're moving from topic to task. So, you know, problem centered learning where the topics get pulled together around the particular task. Our task was how do we solve a second order effect for COVID? That required macroeconomics, it required health, it required psychology, it required engineering, it required all of these different disciplines to be contextualized around the particular task of solving the problem. From course content to situational context, putting people into a different problem based context like a simulation, putting people into a, a rapid fire generative learning session that has a small set of rules that allow for sense making to happen. From learning then doing to doing then learning, try and learn and then adjust. That's what the students will be doing with design thinking and that process for the next four weeks. Performance center to do's are moving away perhaps from a lesson plan to a learning challenge. Uh, from do it yourself to do it together. So at Duke, 70% of a student's grade comes from working together because we know that in the business world, you work on teams. So one of the most important things is to learn how to work on teams. From classroom time to real time, how do we actually manage both of those things? Because all of my students work and their real time is pretty busy right now. I, I have people who, who run countries. They're responsible for, you know, one of my students is responsible for Bolivia for a very large oil company. So he's having to make decisions every single day about all kinds of things. Shut down the well, take my people back home. Uh, so, so we have to kind of integrate those things. From subject matter experts to problem solving networks. So instead of having the subject matter experts to come and pontificate from the pulpit, we actually had them led by the questions of the students to, to solicit their expertise around the questions that the students wanted to have answered to solve their problems. Uh, learning from, teach, from teaching push to learning pull. I was very much just a co-facilitator of this experience. I was, not, um, I was not the driver, I was just a facilitator. From physical classroom to virtual experience, we're kind of being forced into that one right now, but I would, I would emphasize virtual experience, not virtual classroom. From teacher authority to learner autonomy. So um, Francis Frey from Harvard, who I have a lot of time for, uh, said there's only one rule at this point in time when you're an educator in business and leadership, and that is trust the students. Uh, and from content creation to context curation, which is the point that I made earlier. Learner-centered from twos is from teacher-centered to learner-centered, so we have to really kind of orient ourselves around the learners. From all move together to each at his or her own, on his or her own path, so they can all cover as much content as they want. I organize the content by background, because some people have background in health, others don't. By have to have, so that we can have a meaningful conversation and dig deeper. So I have content organized in three buckets so that the students can go whichever, however de deep they wanna go in their area, from one size fits all to one size fits one, uh, meaning that we really wanna curate the experience for that particular person. So learning to change, how might we avoid routinization trap by leveraging new technologies to create ge generative network learning experiences, G-N-L-E, that's, that's the idea. New design rules. Uh, we're moving from a find it out world to a figure it out one. In a find it out world, productive learning is focused on driving individual human conformity around best practice for known and predictable situations. And a lot of training is that. How, what's the best practice and how do I train you to it? In a figure it out world, it's a very different world where nobody really knows the answer. So it's generative learning focused on driving collective human creativity around next practice for unknown and unpredictable situations. COVID-19 has pushed us to the right. We've moved from find it out to figure it out. Not that some things we know about general hygiene practices and like your hands are not applicable, but there's a lot more we don't know than what we do. And therefore we need shared perspective, diverse perspective, working through a dialectic even, if you will, to find our way forward and sense make, which is the, you know, Carl Weick's work. And so what have, what have we learned? Um, we might have to think about programs of study that are topically oriented to curated experiences that are problem oriented. We might have to think of the faculty, God forbid, not as the teacher, but as a collaborator, which was the experience I had, um, and, and not controlling what's learned, but designing a playing field because gosh, these students might actually uncover something really, really important as it relates to COVID. Secondly, uh, role-based cohorts. You know, We tend to think about, let's train the top of the house, the middle of the house, the bottom of the house. Well, people at the bottom of the house might have a really good insight. So perhaps we need collectives of individuals who bring diversity of perspective and experience to a particular problem, irrespective of where they fit in the hierarchy. Um, and, and my great friend, Jay Cross, uh, we have to stop thinking about this just being pouring knowledge into people's heads, but actually tapping into the insight and diversity of perspective of all the people so that we can find our way forward in a new way. Uh, I think we need to move from productive learning 
teaching people how to do things we already know how to do to generative learning, figuring out the things we don't. I think we need to stop thinking about skill forward, question, answer, question, answer, and think about performance back. What are the new skill sets we're going to need in the post-COVID world? And how will our educational institutions ever begin to build that capability in the next 12 months? That's a good question to ask. Uh, don't start with the answer. We don't have the answer. Start with the question and then provide the right scaffolding for sense making to happen. Uh, new rules. Steve Jobs is somebody I've studied quite a lot and um, we have a lot of executives at Apple at Duke. And, and so um, I, I would urge us all to think different and think in the following ways. Uh, think technological affordance over technical automation. Think context curation over content creation. Uh, think problem need over learning objective. Think figure it out over find it out. Think learning to innovate over training to imitate. Think problem solving networks over subject matter experts. Think generative collaboration over productive coercion. We like to think of our students as captives. I don't think we should do that anymore. Uh, I think learning while doing over learning before doing. I think informal learning over formal training. Think learning value over training volume. Uh, I'll end it with a quote with one of my greatest friends who has passed away and a great loss for the learning community, I believe. Don knows him too. Uh, Jay Cross, getting things done requires good connections of the human and internet kind. Schooling has confused us into thinking that learning is equivalent to pouring knowledge into people's heads. It's more practical to think of learning as optimizing our networks. Uh, so my last question to you is, how might we leverage these new rules to design generative network learning experiences for our students? Um, so what did I say? I said that by overcoming age-old learning orthodoxies and collaborating with student design teams, we can change how people make sense of things by co-creating generative network learning experiences. I, I thank you very much for your time. Um, there are more resources out there. Uh, the, I think the URL is wrong, but Don has a new URL. I have, I have a column in Training Magazine, and many of the kind of rules and stuff that I just talked about are, are in these three articles, but there's a number of other articles that talk about how I think about learning, and, and um, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, Don, I was over by four minutes. I apologize, but I'm happy to, um, to have a chat for the next seven or so minutes, if, if you would like. Almost certainly, I interrupted you uh, by two minutes and ran over by two minutes of my introduction. All I can say is that top content based on that combination of a framework of theoretical understanding and practical experience made us think and really useful stuff to go away with. Look, look, you can look at the chat. Fantastic, inspirational. Thank you very much. Lots to think about. There is, there is so much there. We've got questions, and I'm going to, I'm going to. Um, uh, I'm just going to quickly jump back to the um, intro-outro slide so that we can just let you know about the um, uh, sharing questions. If you want to become a, a speaker at OEB, just click that link there. and It'll take you through to information about the conference. Christine has put the link to uh, Tony's article uh, in Training Magazine there. Um, a quick question, because we've got it here from David. Um, Tony, for leadership development and learning, do you think online experience, and I think this comes to the root of a lot that was being discussed, can the online experience be as impactful as the face-to-face -face experience, or is something always lost? And that's the core question everyone's asking at the moment. Tony. I think if we, again, I'll say the same thing, if we fall prey to the routinization trap, physical wins. If we don't, and we really explore the opportunities that the technology affords us, the technological affordances, it can be better. Now, I would say that the last three days I had in, in launching this course were way better than any physical class I had. And I thought my physical classes were pretty good. So I, I, I'd say it's a qualified, <laughs> I'd say it's a qualified yes, as long as we're willing to um, step into the breach of uncertainty try things and be willing to fail. The simulation, when we first hit it, uh, nobody could get on because Amazon Web Services did denial of service. So I had to have a backup with a case study. We had a chat. The technical folks were working the background to make it work and bring it back up. And we just kept rolling with it. I said, this is a learning. You're going to encounter difficulty when you're innovating. And if you're feeling like this sucks right now and I don't want to do it, that's how you should be feeling. And when it comes back up, we're going to jump right back in. That's what leadership looks like in this world. So I do feel that it's possible. Speaking about leadership, 
Thank, thank, thank you, Tony. And I, it is the key question right now. I would also say it's possible. I don't think we need to be focused on anything face-to-face -face as being the best. It has been a default uh, for millennia because it's all we've had. We have other affordances now. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, we'll have a new normal where we have face-to-face uh, -face use for what it's best at, and then we'll have this tremendous digital experience we've built up. Al asks, Tony, what you say fits with students with experience, what about young students? Uh, I think the problem with young students is keeping them off platforms that, 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 that keep their attention and curiosity like Fortnite. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I wrote a book on this with Carl Kapp, actually, Learning in 3D, because there's another question about co-presence. Um, where, where kind of you can have immersive environments that are, that, that, that fully hold the attention of, of students because they have the game dynamic that goes on and the kind of tokening systems, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there's, there, you will, I would be very surprised if we don't see kind of a convergence of Khan Academy and Fortnite into some kind of uh, virtual learning experiences for the younger generation. And I'm excited about that because it'll democratize it around the world. And, and, and then it'll level the playing field in terms of access. Because I think one of the biggest challenges is with the 7.2 odd billion people on the planet, particularly in um, like Africa, the average age in Africa is 18.2. You know, it's very, very, very young. And it's, 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 it's the next place uh, where, where, where you know, it, it'll become the kind of engine of, of, of economic growth for the world. Um, and, and one of the challenges we face today is, is, is well, there's two challenges. There's work and education. And, and, and number one is we're not exactly sure what the work is going to look like post-COVID because there'll be a lot of automation. Uh, and number two is uh, how are we going to prepare people to do it? And, and I don't feel that the existing system, uh, you know, conceived in the 1700s, uh, is equipped to be able to deliver the speed, the, the skills at the speed and scale that's going to be required, especially when the work yardstick is moving. So I would feel that, um, you know, the, the kids are probably hungry for a more immersive kind of learning um, and the educators will have more difficulty moving that way. Tony, we should take a leaf out of your book, reduce your speaking time, increase uh, the discussion. We've got a tremendous amount of, of chat coming through. We are not going to be able to handle all the questions. We're well, sorry about that. Um, a couple of observations. Annette Pedersen says, I'm, I'm relieved that this that you've been able to extend this for four weeks, otherwise the teachers would only have gotten to replicate face-to-face -face online. And actually, uh, when you mentioned that you'd spent uh, your time, that you had you'd managed to get things uh, online in, in 11 days, and that you had a four-week period to do it in. A lot of people were very impressed by that, Mariana, Debbie, Helena, Carlos. Um, but it was also pointed out, KD, Semler, Henrik said, look, we didn't have, didn't have as much time to get things done and also, I think for a lot of people, they're facing the issue of being having their opportunity to deliver compressed as well. In other words, the institutions in which they work, whether that's academic or um, commercial, are saying, yeah, deliver that in a day. When your experience is, actually learning can take place very well if it's spread out, and we don't have to try to replicate one day face-to-face -face online in one day. Any advice, any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, this was only one of my courses. The other course I had, People Analytics, I, I, I had a 24-hour turnaround. Um, and again, I was able to, uh, the first day was was page-turning PowerPoint. But the second day was, um, it was a People Analytics course, which is all about data and people. The second day, I introduced yep. them to uh, the head of the Washington Wizards which is a basketball team here in the United States. And we said all throughout the semester, you're going to have $42 million to pay to buy three players. And you need to do the analysis of their gameplay and of how they will fit with the organization, et cetera, et cetera. So I immediately moved it to problem-based and I had 16 student teams that were working uh, to help this guy who run people analytics for the Washington Wizards figure out who the best three players should be. And at the end, we kind of had a, a, an award ceremony with him saying, uh, you know, how, how how pleased he was with the fact that they run 14 different models, et cetera, et cetera. So I would have never done that had I had my lectures from previously. Uh, and so it pushed me to change it. And I would suggest that the students learned a whole lot more. So so I, I too was in that mode. This was one particular course, but my other course, I literally had a, a day's turnaround and still applied some of these methodologies. And I would argue, again, was able to deliver more value and, and could do another course. I, I could do one on that. You know, how do you turn it around 24 hours if you want? But the, the fundamental rule is the same. Um, 
don't limit the technology to the prior modality of teaching. Flip the equation. Tony, thank you. We got have a lot of questions here, and there were other questions I wanted to get to. We got some uh, to be put to one side. Um, I think that we start off asking people how they felt. Um, I'd like to just wrap up with that same question, if that's all right, Tony. Can I just ask everybody? That was going to be my request. Um, yeah, you... go ahead. Tony, go ahead. No, no, please. Just that it's very simple. Okay, one word. How do you feel? And while people are sharing their thoughts, um, I want to say thank you, Tony, for putting a lot of work into preparing this presentation for us in a time when you're in the middle of doing so much else. Raquel says, hungry. I'm actually pretty hungry as well. I just haven't eaten since breakfast. But also, I'm mentally hungry as well, Raquel. Um, and I'm very grateful, Tony, that you've come and shared this. I'm really looking forward to getting together in Berlin uh, on the 2nd to the 4th um, for OEB. And it's, it's going to be great to have you here. And we're going to continue with this conversation. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for, for coming along and sharing your thoughts and ideas. Um, the webinar, one way or the other, we'll get the information about the webinar uh, out to you. So we have a recording, we have the chat, we have the slides. Those will all be available on the page on the uh, OEB website, and that will be put out on, uh, that will be, information about that will be circulated on Twitter and also via mail shots. And if you registered through the form, then you'll get that information uh, as well. And otherwise, you can look out for it and, on, on Twitter. Uh, and elsewhere. So there was a lot there, a lot of content Tony presented to us with. It would be great to go back and revisit it. Thank you very much, everybody, for your content and your, your insight and your sharing. And I'm glad that people are leaving here feeling inspired, informed, also possibly a bit hungry. Uh, I share that. Um, now, Annette's saying, are we expecting twen OEB 2020 to be a physical event? Yes, we are right now. That's the plan. Um, so please, we're looking forward to meeting everybody in the Marlena bar and sharing a drink. Um, thank you everybody for your thoughts and coming together. And once again, Tony, uh, thank you so much for sharing it. It's now hit nine o'clock on the uh, East Coast. I guess <laughs> your day is just beginning. Tony, thank you so much. Appreciate it, Don. Thanks for having me.